All right, Trent. Big question for you. What is your favorite Star Wars film? Hey guys, Andrew from Cheap Jokes here. Trent and Josh, Lego Masters G'day. Season 2. Howdy. How have you guys been? We last spoke at Episode 2. Uh, a lot's happened since then. Yeah, a lot, lot's happened, but so keen to get into Lego Masters now and, and let Australia get behind it. I think it's a really good time as well with, I guess, what's going on in the world to just sit at home, build your Lego and watch a bit of Lego Masters. And a bit of a hashtag's taken off for you guys, Team Geek and Sleek. Where does that come from? Sure, you can tell. <laughs> Josh, Josh is clearly the geek. <laughs> so no, Josh brings brings the hair. I mean that that season two is a lot about battle of the hair. We've got a lot of great hair going on. There was a lot of conditioner used in the filming of season two. Um, and and clearly, if you look behind me, my level of geekdom is off the charts. So yeah. geek and sleek, and and the sleek. So we've seen some cool photos with your hair, Josh. Uh, uh, you did the paddle pop lion Holden. <laughs> Pretty much tried to find as many lion pictures as I could on the internet of all lion characters. Brisbane Lions was one of them. The lion from Wizard of Oz. All right, so let's do a quick recap. So last time I saw you was episode two, but we've had the fairy tale challenge since. So you guys did Cinderella. Trent, you were telling me a bit too much time was spent on the castle with this one. Yeah, this was a real challenging build for us because we went minifig scale. And I think very quickly we realized that we were focusing way too heavily on the actual castle and probably not enough on those really important story elements. The other challenge that I found really difficult was trying to do this transforming pumpkin carriage because the clock struck midnight and I wanted to capture that moment where it was mid-transformation. And Josh, uh, Cinderella shoe-wise, what would you have done differently to kind of meet that requirement? At Minifig Scale, we had a big challenge to start with. So we had to go with a few translucent pieces to make it look like a slipper. At that point in time, we hadn't had a lot of experience on the show. We're only a couple of episodes deep. So looking back now, after having been through a few more, uh, we can totally see where we went wrong and what we would have definitely done differently. But in the moment, we just didn't really have the experience to know what it is Brickman was looking for. And then episode four, we had the hanging challenge, which was uh, absolutely amazing, a, a very difficult way to build. And you guys did something absolutely amazing. Well, I think uh, this episode is very much a, a rise from the ashes, Phoenix from the ashes type story, because we changed our idea at, of doing this dragon at the start to then scrapping that and going with the birdcage and cat idea. But that did cause a problem in that we committed a lot of the structure and that meant that our hanging brick was on the base of our birdcage. And, and if you imagine the, the physics of having a hanging brick at the bottom, that, that, that platform was just moving side to side like crazy. We had to pull everything out of the bag. We had to scrap our first version of the birdcage. That was our, our turning point in LEGO Masters where we, where we realised what we could do under immense pressure. And then we had the Make and Shake Tower, which uh, we'll, we'll glance over that one, because, uh, <laughs> I mean, uh, you know, you, you experimented with some Technic bricks, but where you experimented with some Technic bricks more or didn't was in the 3D art challenge. Definitely a huge challenge, because we started with a very large animal that we wanted to be jumping out of the frame, like a giant bull, and at this point, I didn't have a huge knowledge on how to use Technic to attach it all together. And so I was adamant and confident that we could just go start on start if we had enough of them, that the clutch power would be strong enough to hold it all together. There was definitely a few skeptical voices in the room, traits included. It was definitely very nerve wracking in those last few minutes getting it to stand up because if that had fallen, I reckon that would have been us going home. And then we've got above and below where you had the farmer pulling the carrot out of the ground huge, even bigger gravity concerns with this one. You've got to keep challenging yourself in this competition. You've got to keep trying to push what you can do. And this very much was us trying to go bigger with our characters. We sort of got in a groove with doing the characters and we wanted to go really big. And, and I think in hindsight, we might have gone a little bit too big with the farmer. Also then that challenge of connecting the rabbit upside down with Technic elements, there was some real challenges getting that retrofitted into space. But 
To Josh's credit, he knows how to solve problems. I would have just given up. If this was me trying this, I would have given up. I couldn't have done it. But Josh kept problem solving and working out how those connections would work. And we got him. In the end of the day, we got the rabbit to fit. We got the farmer on the right angle. Trent, you would have to be happy that you didn't go home because the next challenge would have been devastating if you didn't get to enjoy this one. I, I can tell you, if I'd been eliminated in the above and below build, sitting at home watching what the next one was, I would have been in a terrible state, knowing that it was a Star Wars build. It was a dream build, dream come true. I put it up there in my top moments of, of my life so far. Yeah. Um, just after after wedding and, and birth of the kids, that sort of thing. <laughs> um, but to not only be doing a Star Wars build, but to also have a specific Star Wars brick pit, it's just an absolute magical moment. Uh, so you had to pull out a light side or a dark side minifig. Uh, we got Luke. Uh, light the light side. And... I was super happy with that selection. Dark side super cool, but I just think some of those Jedi vehicles, some of those Republic vehicles, just look so cool. The snow speeder, the X Wing. Ah, oh, it's just brilliant. Obviously, Josh, you had a big. Uh... I guess advantage in this build having Trent on your team as such a toy purist. I feel, I feel like the, the disadvantage of me being on there kind of cancels it out. <laughs> but I, I guess that was a lot of pressure on you to build to Trent's liking. To build that was in keeping with the story of Star Wars was a huge challenge for me. Like I know Star Wars but not well enough to be able to recreate a vehicle from there so I definitely did a lot of running back and forth to the Star Wars brick pit looking at the other already built Star Wars vehicles in there looking at how they're designed and the different elements that are on there and just trying to recreate the style but not copy them exactly the same so try and have the similar things and so it did work well in the sense that Trent could give me a few different jobs to do that I could attach onto the ship as we went like the wings and things like that um, and so yeah Thankfully, Trent was able to explain it really well. So that's a good visual education for the other teams on what Star Wars vehicles can look like by having those in the brick pit, right? Yeah, it was a huge uh, help because every time I was like, I don't know what I'm doing, Trent was like, well, just go look at the other ones in the brick pit. And yeah, it really helped to see how they had done theirs and different styles that are on the pre-built ones already. Trent, were there any teams that stood out to you as non-Star Wars fans? Jen and Jody did a really good effort. They, they maybe seen one of the newer films and that's where they got their inspiration from Ray BBA and I think theirs was really clever their story was exceptional in that Ray starts off in the Force Awakens as a scavenger and so they leaned into that her ship was sort of all these scavenged parts a bit hodgepodge and it was dragging an 80 80 foot which was a pretty cool concept it integrated a lot of really cool Star Wars elements like the wings like the almost the x-wing kind of yep. x-shaped wings and it brought in the colors of bb8 red and orange which is sort of almost synonymous with the the resistance in terms of thematic colors really good credit to them for digging deep and pulling out something that worked really well and walk me through going into that star wars specific brick pit for the first time i was blown away i have a memory of just grabbing andrew who's another big star wars fan and we just embraced and we we're just jumping up and down for joy. It was that kind of elation. I'm a huge toy collector, a um, lot of Star Wars in my collection, love the Star Wars minifigs. So to see this wall of Star Wars minifigs up at the back was incredible, but also all those built models, those stormtroopers just standing guard, walking around, you know, that, that just, put you in the world and it was quite yeah. an incredible experience. It wasn't intimidating having them hanging over your shoulder while you were building? A little bit, but little bit. More, more cool, yeah. More cool? <laughs> Fantastic. I imagine your face walking into the brick pit for the first time is what everyone else's face is like walking into the room you're in uh, for the first <laughs> <Yeah>. time. <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, exactly right. <laughs> what makes uh, the perfect Star Wars vehicle? I'm a big fan of the original trilogy. So that's, you know, Star Wars 1977 up through to Return of the Jedi. And Ralph McQuarrie was a, one of the key designers on Star Wars. And he had a kind of industrial design background. So you look at those ships, they're real. They look real, they look functional. They're a bit old and and worn. You can see that the the rebellion is just scrapping 
ships together, modifying ships. If you go to Hoth, you know, they have to modify the snow speeder to get it to work in the snow. Yeah. So it's that very real life industrial, mechanical, utilitarian sort of look, harsh kind of angles um, that, that really make a Star Wars ship. And then when you get to the Empire, it's all about size. You know, they've got the resources, they've got the equipment to build the Death Star, to build these Star Destroyers. And they're very clean, precise sort of geometrical shapes. Josh, as um, a fan, but obviously not as in-depth, Andrew and Damien won the competition, but if you were to look around the room at everyone's builds and be like, and, and say, yep, that's a ship from Star Wars, who stood out to you in that respect? I did really like Jody and Jen's, their like Ray vehicle was really cool. They kind of redesigned it and came up with their own flair on how the cockpit was going upside down when she was scavenging and stuff. But I definitely really like Andrew and Damien's, especially because we had all just been watching The Mandalorian. Uh, just recently and that was the character that they had pulled out and so they had built this awesome ship that just replicated exactly what it almost looked like in the in the show it was just definitely a set that you could buy off the shelf and build at home and play with and fly around as a as a kid or a, an adult as well if you love it that much <laughs> really really nice touch in terms of story but that those play details they had a, a little mechanism that would turn those engines you know from from upward into sort of forward really? position so very, very nice attention to detail. All right, Trent, big question for you. What is your favorite Star Wars film and why? Now, before you answer, just remember, there are a lot of people watching, a lot of hardcore Star Wars fans that you could potentially upset right now. Go. Uh, look, this is gonna come as a surprise to a lot of people. My favorite film is Return of the Jedi. Okay. It's not Empire, as as a lot. I mean, I love Empire. Empire is brilliant, but there is something in the finale of wrapping up that story and the moment where Darth Vader transitions back to the good side. The, the climax of the film um, is just quite emotional for me. And, and three hours later, opening sequence in in Jabba's palace that then moves into the desert skiff on Tatooine and the, the Sarlacc pit and the way that, you know, Luke fools Jabba and has the lightsaber and does 10 galaxies later. Billy D. Williams as Lando as he's going, getting sucked into the Sarlacc pit. Incredible moment. Uh, 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 Han Solo just regaining his eyesight, trying to shoot the tentacle as it's dragging him in. A long, long time later. The, the, the best film, but only a very close second to Empire Strikes Back. I'll try to stop you there because uh, episode nine's on tomorrow night. We don't want to run over time into their, um, into their time. <laughs> I'm sure you could talk all day about it. Guys, congratulations thus far. Um, you've, you've, you're doing tremendously. Um, there's a few rounds left. Fingers crossed we see you there. All the best for episode nine. Thank you. Thanks, Andrea. Yeah, just having so much fun and we're just going to keep pushing the limit as best as we can and, and hopefully we, we can pull out some nice builds.